Okay, settle down, please. Great. So in the first part of the lecture today, we're going to discuss the concept of agency, specifically to do with religion. Did any of you listen to the podcast? Yeah? Okay, can someone explain what is meant by the term agency as we use in anthropology? So agency is a very specific term as we use it in anthropology. Essentially, the term refers to the fact that we are in a social world with particular structures, institutions. We are positioned in certain ways in the social world. That might be by virtue of our bodies, our, our gender, our race, our class. It might be on the basis of our relationship with particular kinds of institutions, whether it's the state and the kinds of passports that we have. So there's a whole bunch of ways in which we're positioned in the world. And agency asks, in light of this positioning, what kinds of action can we undertake that are explicitly aimed to somehow make a change in the causal world? Do you understand what is meant by causal world? Yes? No? Anyone want to try? No? Okay, causal world is just essentially when we talk about actions causing things to happen. That's all it means. So you do something and that causes something to happen. Yeah? So the causal milieu is the kind of spaces, the social spaces in which actions <laughs> cause certain kinds of reactions or changes or events. Okay? So when we use the term agency, that's really what we're referring to. Okay. So it's intentional action that makes a difference in the social world. Okay? 
So it's the socio-culturally mediated capacity to act, meaning we can't act exactly as we choose to. Okay? For instance, if you have an Indian passport, it is virtually impossible for you to just enter another country without having a visa, even if you want to. Yeah? Whereas if you have a British passport, your choices in the world are different. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's a socio-culturally mediated capacity to act. It recognizes that the ways in which we act are subject to certain constraints that come from our political sphere, that come from our social sphere, that come from our particular cultural understandings of how the world is and ought to be. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So essentially, when we use the word agency, we tend to reserve it for actions that are motivated by some desire to make some kind of change in the causal milieu. Okay? So there's usually, we fall into the term agency, things like motivation, intention, some kind of understanding that you want to change something. Okay? So by picking up this pen, we wouldn't necessarily describe it as an active agency. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah? But if I use this pen to write something on the board, without throwing it down, yeah, then I am actually exercising my capacity in this space by virtue of my position as your lecturer to teach you something using this object. Does that make sense? Yeah? So we don't just use the term agency for any kind of action. We use it for actions that are positioned in certain ways that are intended to change something. Okay. So essentially, we have some key terms that we use when we use the concept of agency. These are the agent, yeah? the person who is acting to make the kind of change that we understand as agentive action. Okay. Agentive, the adjective, is used to describe an action that is intended in that way to make a difference to the social milieu or to the causal milieu. Agency we've already looked at. Patient is the thing upon which that action is exercised. Yeah? Does that make sense? So if I want to change something about your understanding of this concept of agency, right now I'm the agent and you are the patients. If you push back and ask me questions, then you become agents and I become the patients. Does that make sense? Yeah, so agents and patients are not stable terms, they're actually terms that are into ch people change positions. Sometimes we're agents, sometimes we're patients. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So one thing to note about agency, as we use it in anthropology, is it's always exercised in relation to the social. The term agency, <coughs> as we use it in anthropology, I mean, one way of thinking about anthropology, and you know, often people ask, well, is this anthropological? Is this question anthropological? What is anthropology? Well, one of the enduring questions of anthropology, and this is something that you will have already got from your anthropological theory lectures, is that anthropology really tries to understand what is the relationship between individuals and the social worlds. Of which they form a part. Yeah? So you have government structures, you have other people, you have religious institutions and so on, which press people to act in certain ways. Yeah? People are socialized in certain ways to act according. It's a classic book, what you see understanding. Right? There's all sorts of stuff out there, and all of these things affect the person in some way or the other. Their capacities to understand who they are, what they can do, what they should aspire to, and so on. So, these are all acting on the person, in some sense, but the person is also able to act on these. You can change other people's ideas, you can 
change. You can push for changes to the law, you can push for changes in the way your religion sees certain kinds of things or understands certain kinds of things. So anthropology really explores that territory that shows us, okay, what is the balance between what an individual can do and what is somehow incumbent on them to do, or what constrains them. Does that make sense? An agency really sits in that space. Okay? Does that make sense? So essentially, when we use that term agency, we're always thinking about that space, which is in relation to the social. More pens do not work. Yeah? So in that sense, agency addresses exactly the same terrain as practice theory, which you remember from the lecture on practice. Yeah. But where practice theory for Bourdieu is really about how people embody this habitus so that they're not fully aware of how much they're influenced, agency pushes a little bit further from that and says people can be aware and they can intentionally do things in the social world. So habitus is much more focused on how unconsciously we embody certain kinds of expectations, positions, understandings of ourselves and what we can do. Agency says actually people are aware, or they can be aware, not necessarily fully aware of all the constraints, but it does operate in a milieu of awareness. Okay? That's the real difference between the ways in which those two terms are used. Okay, and uh, habitus and practice theory and agency. But they're both aiming towards that same thing, trying to understand, you know, to what extent human action is originating in individuals or in humans, and to what extent it is being influenced by our structures around humans, yeah. or the structures within which humans are embedded. Does that make sense? Are you reasonably clear about the distinction here? Yeah? yeah. Okay. So there are lots of ways in which we can use that term agency. Agency can be claimed. So this basic understanding that I did this. Yeah, then you're claiming agency. You're saying I made a difference to something. Okay? Agency can be delegated. So if you, when you buy houses or whatever it is, then you are delegating your agency to your lawyer who's going to do things on your behalf. Does that make sense? So someone can be your agent so that they can act for you in the social world. Okay? An agency can be attributed, and we see that quite a lot in, certainly in Lerman, but in the other books as well. You can say that actually it wasn't me, it was God. Yeah? There you're attributing agency. Something has changed in the social world, and you're saying, it wasn't me, God. It was God. Yeah? So agency can be deployed in diverse ways. It can be claimed, I did this. It can be delegated, you do this on behalf of me. Or it can be attributed. It wasn't me, it was on someone else or something else. Any questions about anything on this slide, apart from the basic headline stuff I told you? No? Okay. Okay, so agency addresses some fairly key areas. Okay. One is relations. What are the social relations that obtain in any given social media? within which agency might be exercised, claimed, delegated, attributed, and so on. Okay, so we're, we're always, when we're thinking about agency, we're thinking about it exercised in relation to the world within which one lives. Okay? Another key area that we usually think about when we think about the term agency is knowledge. How much do people know? about the nitty-gritty details of the social structures, the relationships within which they are embedded, so that that action that we call agentive is knowingly aimed at changing something. Yeah. Often, the point is that we only have partial knowledge of stuff, and we still try and do something. Right? So full knowledge is not necessary 
to describe something as agentive action, so full knowledge of the causal milieu. But some knowledge is necessary because there is intention and motivation. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. Then we come to intention. What are you trying to do? <coughs> what is this person trying to do in that social world? Okay. What are they intending? What kind of changes do they want to happen? What kind of um, changes do they not want to happen? Okay. So intention is quite crucial when we're thinking about agency. We're also thinking about efficacy. How efficacious, how impactful is a particular action? Now, we all try and change things in the social world. Some of these actions work better than others. So we can also ask that sort of question of agency. And how efficacious is it? What has changed? How successfully has it changed? And power. Who has the power in any given social world to make things happen? And of course, you know from power and culture that different people have different relationships with power. And some people are more powerful within certain, certain social media. They are less powerful than others. The same person may be very powerful in one social field in a Bordeusian sense, but they may be really not very powerful in another one. Some people may be powerless across the board. Yeah, so we're also asking questions about power. So when we think about agency, these are the kinds of areas that we have to incorporate when we use this term. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? OK. So essentially, and this is really crucial, as anthropologists, when we use the term agency, we are attributing some kind of intentionality to that action. It's not just that someone does something and something changes. That happens too, of course. But when we use that term, we are usually thinking about intent. It might be distributed intent. By distributed intent, I mean that if I were an artist, making some kind of public art, where I wanted to change people's understandings, say about climate change, or refugees, or whatever it was, yeah? then my artwork is essentially standing there for me and trying to make that change. I'm distributing my intention through this thing. So as for Jell, the anthropologist, and you don't need to concern yourself too much with this, he makes a distinction between what he calls primary agents, who are usually people, and secondary agents, the kinds of things, artworks, writings, all kinds of things by which we distribute our intentions to the world. Yeah? So even if the person is not there, that thing speaks for them or for their intentions. Okay? Any questions about this? No? Okay. So when we think about this concept of agency, it allows us to ask certain kinds of questions. One is what makes social action possible? What are the conditions within which agency and social action is possible? What constrains social action, conversely? What makes us unable to do certain things, socially speaking? Yeah. To what extent is social action determined, and to what extent does it originate in the person who's acting? Yeah. This is all the telling of agency. Is there a difference between the ways in which differently positioned people are able to be agents? That doesn't make a difference what kind of person you are, what kind of body you have, how you are located vis-a-vis -vis institutions, how you are located vis-a-vis -vis other people. Can the exercise of agency change social structures, norms, or rules? Does an action, does a single action succeed in changing things like these, deep-rooted structures, 
or laws or rules, or do we need some kind of collective action? Well, lots of people are exercising agent of action, perhaps at the same time or over a long period of time, but gradually things start to shift. In which case, where do we locate agency? But equally, we can ask how do people act agentally to maintain structures and norms? And there might change might be in the air. And there will always be some people who say, no, actually, I want things to continue as they are. So they might act agentally to strengthen certain kinds of institutions, to shape public opinion in certain kinds of ways. Okay? Any questions about any of this? So we can also identify different kinds of agency. Now, the most common way in which we use the term agency in anthropology is in terms of resistance and critique. Now, but it's not the only kind of agency there is. So resistance and critique is where you are actively resisting something. You are definitely critiquing something. You are trying to change some kind of norm or rule. The social movements are examples of resisted agency. Yeah. The kind of schism that we see in Berlin, where these people are saying, well, this kind of God that the establishment churches prefer is not the kind of God we want, so we're actually just going to found our own church. And that's a resisted agency. Okay. But we also have what Sabah Maimouth describes as docile agency. Docile agency is where you say, I actually believe that these things are right and good. So in order to live up to these standards and norms that I agree with, I have to do work on myself and I might have to do work on the social world so that I can comfortably inhabit these norms. And we see that a lot in the, in the liberatory book. We also see it in the Fader book. Right? Where you have the people who are completely committed to the ultra-orthodox way of doing things and who might have to push against, say, husbands, wives, and so on, who are beginning to express doubts. And they're saying, no, your doubts are your own. I actively believe in this thing. And I want to live according to its rules. Yeah? We see that in Liberatoria as well where the two generations actually do it very differently for the older generation, their docile agency is very much exercised in relation to the Somali mosques, yeah, where they inhabit that kind of Somali Islam that the mosques are teaching them. Whereas for the younger women, their agency is much more exercised in relation to other ways of thinking about Islam, much more textual ways of thinking about Islam and working with diverse interpretations to work out you know, what is the right Islam? Yeah, those are all examples of docile agency. Okay. We have delegated agency, which I talked about briefly, and we see that quite a lot in the Srinivas book, right? where the priests are delegated to perform rituals on behalf of people. They're the technical experts, and they have the right kinds of bodies, So people can't do these rituals for themselves because they don't know, and they're also not of the right class. And so they delegate the priest to do the ritual on their behalf so that they reap the benefits of the ritual. Yeah, so we see quite a lot of delegated agency in of us. Okay? <coughs> and we have secondary agency. So secondary agency is where someone is getting someone else to do something and distributing their agency in some way. Yeah? Here it looks quite close to delegated agency. Okay, again, we see that in all the books and we'll come to that in a minute. Any questions? No? Okay. I'm going to assume that you're understanding everything. But if you don't, then do ask. Yeah? Okay. 
So as I said, this is one of the most common ways of thinking about agency in anthropology, as resistance. <coughs> and we do see it in our books as well. And we see it definitely in hidden heretics, where the people who have existential doubts, radical doubts, life-changing doubts, are starting to find other kinds of avenues to try and explore these doubts, to try and push back against what they understand as kind of overwhelming control over their lives. And in doing so, they are finding other social spaces for themselves, other ways of being in the world. And they're also using it potentially to push back at the other orthodox establishments. Yeah. Okay. But we might want to open up this notion of resistance a little bit more. You can have open resistance. People will just say, I'm not doing this. I think it's wrong. I'm either going to push really hard to change this given social situation or this given social setting. Yeah, like the people who are fighting against, for instance, um, historical child abuse allegations in favor that we begin with. Or you might have what one might call a more negotiated resist resistance. Right? Where people are saying, well, I have these doubts and they're really existential, they're really serious life-changing doubts. But because I want to preserve my family, because I still want to be part of the social life of this community, I'm going to resist, but I'm going to do it in other spaces that are more open to that kind of resistance. But here, I'm going to, in, this, in this space, I'm going to negotiate how I'm going to resist. Not so much that I will be kicked out, but a little bit so that I can show what it is that I'm feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Or we might see what one might call a reclamation of personal agency, where people are saying, I can't change the social structure. Nothing I do is going to shift the establishment. So I'm just going to get out, and then I'm going to find another way of living my life. And we see that also in Vega. We see it in all the books, the people who join the Vineyard Church even though their families are not that happy. Okay. And interestingly, in London we don't see anyone who leaves the church, but there are people like that as well. Yeah, who might say, okay, I've, I've had enough of giving up everything to this relationship with God. I'm now done. In Liberatory, we see a fair bit of negotiated resistance when people are trying to both live up to their understanding of what it is to be a good Muslim and be accepted in the workplace or in terms of general social life. We see the woman who says, well, I'm going to stop wearing the full veil, but I'm going to wear long skirts and long sleeved shirts. And I'm just going to cover my head. Right? So we see all kinds of negotiations and compromises. And that is mostly what we will see. Right? So does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So here we turn to agency as submission or docile agency. This we see in three of the four books, quite a lot. We see it in Lerman, where people are submitting to these practices, these disciplines, these ways of engaging in prayer, learning how to pray so that they can hear God. And then they act according to what they say God wants them to do. So we see women who are saying, well, I was walking along and I suddenly felt this strong urge to go in the other direction and to go towards that place. And lo and behold, there was an accident there and God wanted me to be there. So I put aside my plans for the day and I followed God's plans for the day. Okay? We see it in um, Liberatore, where people are saying, well, I want this kind of good marriage, but the kind of marriage that I want, I want it also not just to be satisfying in relation to my husband, 
but I also wanted to help me build my relationship with Allah. And therefore, I need to submit certain ways of understanding how marriage should work, or how I should find my marriage partner. We see it in Fader, the people who definitely want to stay within the norms of the ultra-Orthodox church, or community. Yeah? We see it less in Srinivas, because it's a much more free-floating space, in some sense. People are moving between temples, they're moving around, they're trying to do various things, they're very, very experimental. So we see less of that docile agency in Srinivas. Right? Rather, what we do see is the ways in which they use things like the processions of the gods to try and find a way of expressing their own emotions. Yeah? Okay. One important thing in the anthropology of religion is, of course, non human Non-human agents such as God and Lerman, God and Veda, God and Liberatory, or the gods in Srinivas. They're all acting in the social world. They might be acting directly in the social world, for example, in uh, Lerman. They might be acting through establishment figures, the rabbis, the imams, and so on, in both Feder and Liberatory. And they might be acting through the priests and the kinds of things that the priests are doing in Srinivas to say to people, these rituals will allow us to integrate the divine world and the mundane world in certain ways, yeah? so that everything goes in harmony. Does that make sense? So when we're thinking about the anthropology of religion, we're also always thinking about non-human agents. Okay. So when we think about, say, Tyler's definition of religion, it's that belief in supernatural beings. There's not much point believing in something if it does nothing in the world. So when we're in that terrain of the anthropology of religion, we're always taking into account these non-human agents. Yeah? Any questions from this slide? No? Okay. So I've already told you about this primary and secondary agents. The primary agent is the agent who is doing something intentionally. The secondary agent is the delegated agent that is doing something on your behalf. Sometimes it's really not very clear in the ways in which people attribute agency, certainly in religion, whether something is a primary agent or a secondary agent. People themselves are often not very clear. So the example I give here is from my own field work, where there's a, there was a Hindu priest and he was telling me about going on this quite... So where I do field work in Tamil Nadu in South India is... It's, it's quite an arid area. There's a lot of kind of wasteland with thorny bushes where goats and cattle graze. And there's a lot of snakes, where it's up from India. Yeah. There's a lot of snakes. And so this priest was telling me about how he was going somewhere and there was a shortcut through this quite thorny patch of wasteland. And just as he was about to go into it, um, this man came running over and said to him, don't go there, they've seen snakes like cobras, I think it was. And the priest said, oh, okay, so he didn't go. And he was telling me later, you know, God must have sent that man to protect me. And I said, oh, really, why do you think so? And he said, oh, maybe not, maybe he was just a nice man. Yeah, so people don't necessarily have to be utterly clear. Yeah, is this God or is this just a nice human being? Okay, so this relationship between primary and secondary agents can often be not as clear as one might expect. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So one thing as anthropologists that we're very attentive to 
is what difference do people's conceptions of agency make? So we're paying attention not just to what we think is happening in that social world, but how people understand what's happening in that social world. So in the anthropology of religion, we certainly have that a lot where people are saying, you know, God made me do this. Or this particular thing happened because of this ritual. Or my faith is growing because I had this accident and that suddenly told me something that I should have known. I think it was God telling me something. Right, so the point is that it's not just that we might have certain ideas about what is going on and why something has happened. But we pay quite a lot of attention to what people are saying has gone on and what has caused that particular thing to happen. And so when you're looking, if you want to work with the concept of agency for your final essays, try and pay attention in your monographs to how people are explaining why something has happened. Or how something has been made to happen. And who exactly has made it happen. If you want to go beyond your monographs, you can also look at this paper by Kasaniki, which is really interesting. It's about um, one village in, or well, two villages in northern Thailand, and there are both Christians and Buddhists in this village. And they both understand agency in very, very different ways. Yeah, for the Christian ties in, this, in these two villages, God is very much present and acting in the world. So when they attribute agency, they attribute it often to God. God made this happen. God will help and so on. Whereas for the Buddhist Thais in these villages, there isn't really that concept of the Buddha or some kind of divine entity acting or making things happen. That stuff happens because of karma. And you can do some things in this life to make your karma better in your next life. But you can't really call them divine assistance to change something that is caused by karma. Yeah, so they don't really think about agency in the supernatural or by supernatural entities. They really think about what they need to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, so even in the same place, if you have two different religious complexes at work, the ways in which people understand cause and effect, their own capacities, who else is acting, these things will vary quite a lot. Yeah, and we'll think about that next week when we think about pluralism. Because pluralism essentially is a situation where lots of different ideas are played in the same place and time. And people have to manage that. They have to work out how to live by their own beliefs while also accepting that other people may do things very, very differently. The kinds of worlds that we inhabit now are very pluralist worlds. Any questions about any of this? So essentially, to conclude, the concept of agency doesn't really originate in the anthropology of religion. It's a broader anthropological concept. It's really a concept that anthropology kind of makes its own to explore precisely that balance between the world and individuals and how action takes place in that interface between structures and persons. Yeah, but it's a very, very useful concept in the anthropology of religion. Because in the anthropology of religion, we see that agency works as docile agency, it can work as resistance, it can be negotiated. There are non-human entities that are very much attributed agency that make a difference to the ways in which people understand the world and inhabit it. So it's a really useful concept for the anthropology of religion. Okay? Right. So let's play a little game. I'd like you to tell me what kind of agency 
might be identifiable in each of these examples. So it's just traits, the agency of people who are acting in a social world where they know that people won't urinate or dump rubbish on a site where it happens to get it. Right? So it's a very straightforward exercise of human agency using particular ideas that are prevalent in that social world. Yeah? Does that make sense? This is not a complicated example, right? Yeah? Okay. Let's try another one. which is supported by the priest, but its efficacy is very dubious somehow. Yeah? Does that make sense? Oh, okay. I mean, it's dubious. Um, well, for those of you who are reading Shirima, you'll see why it's dubious. But for those of you who are not, there are already laws in India that uh, prevent the exclusion of people on the basis of caste from temples. Yeah? It is illegal to say to someone, you can't come into the temple on the basis of their past. Any Hindu is allowed to go into any temple. So there are laws, the structures are there to enable this man to just walk into the temple if he pleases. But the point is that it's not happening, right? Because it's not just the legal framework, but it's also social ideas about who's, what kind of body is appropriate in what kind of space. And that's really what the Archbishop is pushing. And the priest is supporting her, and we don't know Certainly, when you read the book, we don't know whether the priest is supporting her because he feels a bit embarrassed for her and quite likes her. But, you know, whether he would have welcomed this man anyway had the Antipodes not actively invited him in. Yeah? So we see that someone is trying to do something, but we can't quite see whether this is actually going to change the ways in which the worshippers in that temple or indeed the priests might treat people like him in the long term. So we can certainly question the efficaciousness of this particular exercise. Okay. What kind of agency are we seeing here? Again, this one is very straightforward. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just straight to the very good. Yeah? Someone wants something to be done, to change something in the world, in this case a ritual. They can't do it themselves, they just pay someone to do it for them. Just straight to the Yeah? Okay. What kind of agency are we seeing here? Those are agency. Those are agency, absolutely. Yeah? She is 
inhabiting these norms because she thinks they're good and right. That means training herself to be disciplined in certain ways with regards to her body, with regards to her relations with other genders, with regards to her participation in the workforce, using the internet, and so on and so forth. It's definitely those are agency. Yeah? Okay. What are we seeing here? Sorry? Did someone say something? Okay. What are we seeing here? What are we seeing here? Yeah. Negotiated resistance. Yeah. But it's negotiated resistance, right? I mean, in some sense, this is a really complex mix because she's negotiating something, she's resisting, and she's accepting. Very good. So it's a really, this is a complete mixture of those different kinds of agencies. Because on the one hand, she's accepting that she can't just say, you know what, I don't want any more children. I'm going to go on birth control pills. She knows that's not possible in this particular milieu. But she still wants to do it. So she's working out, okay, how can I get permission to go on birth control pills? And she's doing that in a very particular way that involves negotiation and resistance. So this is quite a complex example. Right? And that's important to know. And the reason I put that up is because you will see, it's not that like you can just go, wow, okay, I can see what kind of agency is going on here. Yeah? In life, life is messy. There are rules that we simply can't break, just overtly, just like that, without losing quite a lot of stuff. You know, in her case, she stands she's at risk of possibly losing her custody of her children if she pushes her resistance too far. But she wants to reclaim some agency over her body. And this is the way in which she finds a route for herself to do so. Yeah? So it's definitely negotiated, it's definitely resistance, and it's also some kind of submissive agency, all at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. And what we see is that, you know, cumulatively, if lots of people start to do this, you might get some shift. But it's not necessarily a fully acknowledged shift. Yeah? The establishment is not going to say, fine, birth control pills are fine for everyone. Right? It has to be negotiated each time by individual women in different ways. Okay? So the efficacy, we might say, is dubious in terms of a whole scale shift in norms. Right? But there's a bit of give. Yeah? <laughs> okay. What are we seeing here?
So you can take this almost in two parts. In the first part, we're seeing a certain kind of agency. And in the second part, we're seeing another kind of agency. <coughs> and then in the third part, we're seeing yet another kind of agency. So let's say three parts here. What's the first one? What are they doing vis-à-vis -vis their mothers? What are these young women doing vis-à-vis -vis their mothers? Um, Resisting. Resisting. Yeah? They're saying, we don't like the way you are doing Islam or thinking about Islam. So they're resisting. So what are they doing then? Absolutely. So they are seeking a purer kind of Islam for themselves and they are submitting to some of those ideas right? with on due reflection. They are thinking about, about it and they are submitting. So it's these young women who are doing the halal dating, for instance. Yeah? So there is a certain kind of submission, there is a submissive agency, a docile agency that's going on here. Yeah? And then on the basis of that, they are gathering strength to resist something, FGM in this case, where they're saying that actually this is not Islamic. So this docile form of agency towards what they understand as pure Islam gives them the basis to fight against what they now understand as a cultural practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, so sometimes in order to fight against something, you might have to find that ground from which to fight, and that can involve docile agency. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So this is a very similar case again, right? So for these young women, that marriage partner is quite important, not only because it's about a fulfilling relationship on earth, but it also, the right marriage partner can also help build their mind, that kind of relationship with God. Yeah. So on the basis of that, on the basis of a certain kind of understanding of what it is to be a good Muslim woman, what these women are doing is building the grounds to resist other kinds of advice that they're giving. Right? So it's very similar to the previous one. Does that make sense? So what I want you to get from these is that we have these concepts. We have a concept like agency. It's a really useful concept. Right? But it's useful in all kinds of ways. And it's useful in partial ways when we think about the messiness of life. The kinds of choices people have to make. The ways in which they have to negotiate living in the world with other people. And the changes that they might want to bring about personally in their own lives or societally. And you can't just go in there and say, guys, this is rubbish, let's get rid of it, let's change it. And you have to find those grounds from which you can mount a particular kind of action. Right? So agency requires work, like everything else. To actually make a difference in the social causal milieu, People have to put in certain kinds of work into the world, into themselves, and so on. And in the anthropology of religion, we see how they put in that work through religious resources. Right? Either by submitting to them, by resisting them, or finding another way of understanding God, whatever it is. Yeah? So it's a very powerful concept. But once we start thinking about it ethnographically, we can start thinking about it in more and more refined ways. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so we're at the end of this part of the lecture now. I'll give you five minutes and then we'll move to a revision session. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, I notice that people are really quiet. I cannot do a revision session if people don't come up with their questions. It's not really possible. Because, as I say, I can only guess what you're worried about. I cannot know. 
you have to tell me. And there is nothing wrong with speaking up in class. Now, once you leave university, you will never find such a supportive space in which you can just put your hand up and say something, and people will listen to you and try and engage. Yeah? And it's really important to gain that confidence in lectures. Because once you're out in the world, it's, these are things you will have to do. And you may as well practice them in a very, very supportive space. Okay? There are no bad questions. I promise you there are no bad questions. There might be questions that are not very well phrased, but then it's my job to make sure that I understand what it is that you're asking. Does that make sense? So don't be scared of asking, don't be scared of putting your hand up, don't be scared of saying, I don't get this, tell me. Right? Someone asked a question last week, and we spotted a punctuation mark that makes a difference, right? So you're actually helping yourselves. Yeah? So take your five minute break and come back and bold and just put your hands up and ask. Okay? And then we'll try and figure out how best you can tackle this final essay. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, sure. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm alright, I spilled my lunch on my shirt, so I had to wash it five minutes before the lecture. I was like, oh, what? Is it dry? You can't see it, yeah. But, yeah, I washed it and then I was drying it in front of me, like a dryer. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of wondering around the department, like, does anyone have a spare shirt? <laughs> How are you getting on with uh, marking? I've got 12 to go. Yeah, I've got the same actually, about half. I think it's 22 each, I've figured out. Okay. It's 66 Perfect. total. Perfect. They're good, aren't they? Yeah, so far actually. Okay. This is all being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting your um, discussion of agency, your story about the, the snake guy. Mm. I remember reminding me of a similar story in, in my field work where this lady spoke about how she there was a man up a billboard painting and it's a really long ladder and the ladder sort of looked a little bit hairy so this lady came and just held the ladder for about 15 minutes. Um, the guy stepped down, not even knowing that she'd been there, sort of thing. And right. she wondered whether that was her purpose. That ah. God had sent her, put her on this earth for those 15 minutes to stop that man from falling. Interesting. It, it got me thinking about like, agency and purpose because it can't be, because God sends you in one sense, but then it can't be that God sent you because otherwise you can't fulfill your purpose. It has to be come from you. Yeah, it's, it's in Christianity it's very complicated, right? Because mm. of course there's a whole issue of free will, mm. which really puts a kind of kibosh in the works, you know. Um, there's always, of course, you know, theologically minded Christians and non-Christians always go into Judas. Mm. You know, because if Judas hadn't done what he did, then, you know, then the sacrifice, Doesn't which is work. a really important yeah. thing, couldn't have happened. Mm. So do we blame Judas? Do we not blame like, like, was Judas acting as God's agent in order to fulfill this part? Mm. So it gets really, really, really complicated. But what I love about agency and the unfolded of religion is, of course, there's a whole bunch of other players who mm, yeah. <laughs> just kick in in, in <laughs> really interesting ways. It's just funny, sex, sex, sex stuff. Have you got a MacBook at home? Yep. Is that maybe where that's come from, I wonder? Some random
Stealing laptops from. Oh, yeah. well, you know, it's just that design of that building. Yeah. Because ideally, when the doors open, mm. but then it's just the way they plan that makes you come. Yeah. So we end up with a kind of half dependency. Keep the doors locked and shut everyone up. Particularly with students, I still have to yeah. go You have to go and get them. Well, now they've got the phones as well, so I still mm. haven't figured out, you know, how exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Karen said once that the building's like, it's set up like a call centre, and since yeah, then I can't designed, stop thinking. I think I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop seeing. Yeah. Okay, settle down please. As noted last week, it has three parts. The first part invites you to pick a particular concept or concepts, themes or framework on which you want to focus. Okay? So that sets up your introduction for you. If you want to focus on agency, for instance, yeah, that's what you will tell us at this point. The second part invites you to think about this concept or set of concept related concepts or theme or framework that you've selected. To think about what the ethnography allows you to do in relation to them. Yeah? How the ethnography pushes you to think about these things in specific ways from the ethnography. Yes. Um, so I have like an idea of like the main themes uh -huh. that we're doing. But I, I find that like there are some like other themes which are sort of like which is how I'm reading it is sort of like inescapable yeah, to absolutely. do with that theme. So how many themes are too many themes? Well, so there isn't such a thing as too many. The question really is how much justice can you do okay. to what you selected. So suppose you take practice. Yeah. Then an immediately related thing is practicing. Right? But you might find that ritual actually, because it's a form of practice, might be something you want to extend into. And that would be completely fine. But ultimately, if you go into from practice to ritual to agency, then you're starting to spread yourself thin. Does that make sense? So the point is that you have to decide how closely related are these sets of things that I cannot speak of one without pulling in the other. 
Or do you want to say, okay, I can pull in all of these things, but really I don't have the time to do that or the space. So I'm going to really concentrate on these two or these three. You do not get marks according to how many things you talk about. So, so would it be okay, <laughs> like, so if I kind of narrow it down, mm -hmm. like, uh, would it be okay to kind of do like a little, like a little side note about something, like, just when it relates, and then, That's like, amazing. so for example, if I'm talking about ritual, and, uh, like, like, because cause I'm kind of stuck, I, I find that when I'm talking about ritual, I think the body comes up a lot, but then also, um, modernity or whatever the theme was in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about like change and stuff like that. Yeah. And like I, yeah, I'm just kind of and then also like I want to talk about liminality as well and like I don't like it's starting to sound like a lot to handle for yeah. a three thousand word essay. Yeah. So ask yourself, you know, why why liminality? Like I, I can see the threads you're drawing, but I I'm struggling to see why liminality, so really push yourself to see, is this a logical kind of place that I have to go to, or is it a place that I could go to, but I don't have the time right now. And maybe for my dissertation next year, I can really hit liminality as something I want to think about really fast. Okay. Remember, each, each exercise is only a step in some other big, bigger thinking you might do next year. Okay. In fact, a lot of people end up doing dissertations on religion. Which is quite interesting. Because of the way in which the course is structured to start getting get you to start getting interested in some concept and then thinking, oh my god, I could expand it. So there's always room to, do, to come back to stuff that you think older. But maybe not just now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But um, I was kind of concerning that you say that because like I thought that liminality was a like, well, I can't see it right now, but if you come to a master's salon, you can explain to me in quite a lot of detail, and then maybe I'll think, don't, I should have seen it. Okay. So, don't, you know, remember that in a, in a big setting like this, we can't spend too much time on that particular no, thing. Yeah, yeah. But if you have, if you think, actually, I don't know why some of your singular analysis is not really integral to this, come and tell me. And we can trash it out. That's what office hours are for. Okay. Yeah? So, when we end this lecture, I'll walk back to my office. Anyone who wants to come to an office now, just walk back with me. We can take it in turn, ten minutes each. We can sit together, or if you want to see me individually, you can wait outside when I deal with one person, and then I'll come and get the next person. And we can do this. Yeah? Okay? So I would invite you to come back if you don't have a tutorial at three. Okay. So the second thing is you're asking from the ethnography. This point about critically explore invites you to use one of two classic essay structuring models. Okay? And I'm going to tell you both. <coughs> what it means is that you might start off with one ethnography. It could be Lerman, but it could be you could start with your second monograph if you think actually that's a better launching point for me for this argument I want to make. You start there and you tell us in detail how this concept or set of concepts or framework or theme needs modification or needs to be expanded slightly from what you're learning in the ethnography. Yeah? When we come to the critically examined bit, you might say, okay, but Lerman only allows me to go this far. Right? But actually this other ethnography is telling me some other stuff about the same set of concepts or themes. And therefore, I'm going to say, this is the limit of learning in this particular case. Let's turn to something else, i.e. the second ethnography. Does that make sense? Yeah? It, yeah. So that mean you don't have to do 1,200 words on one and 1,200 on the other. You can interweave them, but you have to be very careful with structuring because you end up spending too much time if you're into grief and you're not really... If you write a lot, you know, if writing is something that you think, I write a lot, I can actually do this deftly enough without wasting words, then by all means do so. If you think actually it's going to be much more economical of words, if I really stick with this, come to a conclusion, and then point out what the gaps are or the problems are and then move to the next one and really stick with that 
and an end, you'll get a more tightly structured essay. If you want to interleave, you've got to make sure that all the relevant information is there. And people tend to forget, and I'm telling you this having marked for 15 years now, people tend to forget that they haven't said some crucial stuff. Or they think they've said it, or they, or they say it and then they say it again. Yeah? So you end up repeating it and things like that. So just, you're free to do it if you think you can handle it. Yes. The easier structure for something like this where you're only working really with two main ethnographic texts is to take each of them on its own. It's, it's a structuring thing, it's, it's, it's just a technical point. It's not that you'll get marked down if you do it some other way. It's just you have to be able to handle it economically with the world limit you have. Sorry, there was a hand up there. Uh, so it says like the gaps in the ethnography is so yeah. a few gaps from both of them. So uh, it's really obvious for me like what the gaps are in Theda, mm -hmm. sorry, not Theda, in Lerman and mm -hmm. Red Theda, because Theda includes a lot of the things which I think the gaps in Lerman mm -hmm. is much up, but I don't really see so much the gaps in uh, in Theda in comparison to Lerman. Yeah, so in Theda, the gaps are really, um, so so Theda's work is interesting, right, because her first book was really the people who were completely conforming, particularly women, to the ultra-orthodox world. So the second book actually is the gaps from her first book. Do you see what I mean? You're not going to be able to address gaps that you can't see in the book itself, so don't worry about it. Yeah. My point is that there are gaps in Theda. I mean, among the gaps are things like, um, you know, what, what happens if people change their minds? Like, how is there a route back? Right. So there are, there are certain kinds of gaps in failure, but you can just say, you know, there are some things that we're not seeing. We're not seeing, for instance, why people might conform in such great degree, but we can't deal with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because although Lerman talks about like, people coming into the religion uh, from outside, they're not like re entering once they left. Because, they, because Lerman sorry, doesn't deal with people who have left in the first place, he doesn't talk about people who uh, have doubts and then leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. She doesn't. She doesn't talk about children. You know, which is really important because for Lerman, so much of it is people who come in as adults and who are wholly committed at that point, right? We don't see, unlike, say, in, in failure, we see children who are really important in that social reproduction and in holding their parents to certain norms. Right? So we see um, sons who are questioning their mothers about why they're wearing trousers. We see daughters who are furious with usually the mothers um, about uncovering their hair, for instance, and so on. And we also see how the authorities use the children as threats. You know, they say, if you don't conform, your child will be kicked out of school. So in, in Feda, we see what children can do in a religious setting. Right? So you just have to identify that. And then if you think, okay, there are some things that Feda hasn't gone into, but I can't talk about them. You know, I can just identify them, that's fine. If you can't, if you think for your purposes, you know, this is, Feda's telling you all the things that you wanted to think about in relation to, say, authority and control, you can stop them. So if there are gaps, identify them. Yeah, if there are gaps, identify them. Yeah. If there are gaps, identify them. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And there are always going to be directions in which you can take this stuff. Right? So in Feda, for instance, we don't see how, you know, the big gap is you know, in a legal system where birth control is legally anyone is able to use contraception, how does the church kind of, or the um, synagogue circumvent kind of legal protections? You can raise that as a question, but we don't have the answers because Feda is not talking about it. So that gives you directions for future research, and someone else might be doing that research. Yeah? Yeah. I also lost one thing about the first point as well about the, if we did like a central and then sort of everything is related to that, but then talk about how sort of like lower themes within the ethnographies relate to that central theme. Would that, would that be a good way? Yeah, that would be absolutely fine. So what I'm going to show you, actually maybe let's start somewhere else. Um, 
Okay. Right. Okay. So I've made a table here for you to think, you know, about how to think about this. Yeah? So essentially, if you look at this table, I've picked for an example for you guys the theme and argument. That's your first part. Okay? So the theme that I've, the main thing that I've picked is belief and the sub-theme is doubt. Right? So in that first part, essentially, you're explaining that the terms, whatever terms you're, you're working with, you're showing why they're important in the anthropology of religion, or why they're important to your argument, whichever works for you. Stating your argument, or if you don't have a clear argument, if you say, I just want to explore this in light of these two ethnographies, stating your hypothesis, why this particular term cuts across both your ethnographies, whatever your hypothesis is. Yeah? If you're working with particular scholars, name them, explain what they're saying, yeah, and show how you're going to work with that. If you're working with one scholar, make sure you Explain how they're working with that term. Say if you're working with Simon and Carlyle's paper, explain what they mean by believing selves and why it's different to just some kind of focus on belief as just a thing out there, rather the believing self is a work in progress, essentially. Okay, if you're working with more than one scholar, make that same kind of explanation. Yeah? Okay. Then <laughs> From there, you can go to your first ethnography, where you're really expanding these points ethnographically. Yeah? You're showing what works about this way of thinking about belief, say, believing cells, and how long is a very good ethnography for thinking about that. Okay, and how what Lerman does is really introduce that notion of doubt into that story. Having done that, yeah, you say, okay, here in Lerman, that's not such a bad thing. And the church has ways of managing that. Okay. What Lerman doesn't show us is dissonance. She's not showing us control. She's not showing us authority. What we're seeing is a fairly flat structure where it looks like everyone is quite nice and helping everyone else achieve that relationship with God, helping people work through their doubts, helping people work through their prayer failure. Yeah. And then you might say, well, what does belief and doubt look like in another ethnographic setting? Right. So there's your gap right there. It allows you to move into your next ethnography. <coughs> Suppose your next ethnography is, let's see. Suppose your next ethnography is Feda. Okay. In fact, belief is not a choice. Right? These are not people who come into this religion as adults trying to find a form of Christianity that works for them. These are people who are born into that particular community. Right? And being born into that community means as a member of that community, you are expected to follow the particular rules that are based on a certain belief right, that we are the chosen people. It is up to us to maintain these rules. We cannot fail God in the mission that He's given us right, to lead our lives in this kind of way. Yeah. So here, that is deeply problematic. That is Sayer's point. So unlike in Lerman, here doubt is really pathologized. It's managed. It's controlled. People are really kind of put off articulating that. Belief here depends on an acceptance that does not allow room for doubt, or not allow room for expressing doubt. And then these people have to find somewhere else to express doubt. They can't do it within that space. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what we're seeing is two very different religious complexes. One is a particular church that is founded, and remember, it is really important to note that when we're talking about Lerman, we're not talking about all Christians. When we're talking about Feder, we're not talking about all Jewish groups. We're talking about particular groups. Vineyard Church, 
ultra orthodox and Okay? So there we can start to see that you know authority is really important as well in religion. And it might be it might work for one kind of church to really not focus on power or struggle or anything. But not all religious complexes are that harmonious. Right? So belief and doubt play out in different ways. Does that make sense? If you were working with, say, liberatory, yeah. So belief is important and stated. This is a religion of the book. There is a shahada or a creed where people say a certain thing, and that's kind of stated belief. But it plays out very differently, as we see in the book, between the two generations. For the first generation, that turn to Islam comes out of a stronger belief that it was because, after independence, the new government kind of abandoned Islam, that there were so many troubles. There was civil war in Somalia. Right? So the turn to Islam comes out of the abandonment of Islam is a kind of diagnosis for political problems. And so they build a very particular kind of Islam for themselves that is tied to the Somali mosques. It's also tied to particular aspirations for their children, and the mosques give them a space where they have classes for the children after school classes, they help them in all kinds of ways, so that the Somali mosque becomes woven into their, into their lives, and it becomes you know, so it, it, this belief becomes part and parcel of the ways in which they lead their lives in London. And for the second generation, belief is very important, but for them, it's belief in the right things. The right, the correct Islam. So they are saying the Somali mosque is doing some stuff, but it's really mixing up culture and Islam. And what we want is to separate culture from Islam. We want to find out what is the pure Islam. And that's what we should believe in. Right? That's why these young women are mosque hopping. They're going to the Pakistani mosques, they're going to the Indian mosques, they're going to the Bangladesh mosques, they're going to the Arabic mosques, they're going all over the place because they are trying to find something that gives them Islam without all of this cultural baggage. Right? So their doubt is playing a role definitely. Yeah? And they support each other in their quest. Does that make sense? So here we see something that looks a little bit more like um, learning, but it's not as settled as learning because they, they, they don't have a church. Right? They don't have a particular congregation. Right? What they have is a particular idea that there is a pure Islam and that they can learn how to find it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. And here we also like in learning we find that the authority figures, so for the older generation, for the mother's generation, the authority figures are sitting in the Somali mosques. For the younger generation, they're not quite so accepting of authority. They want someone to explain. So when um, the woman says to one of the, the female, the sheikha says to one of the um, young, devout women, she says, well, you must cover your head. And she says, why, where, where does it say? So she's not accepting authority, and we see something that's a bit flatter like we see in love. Right? So belief is not coming from a single authoritative source. Yeah, it feels much flatter for the younger women. For the first generation, it feels like there's definitely a center of authority. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, when, for example, you're mentioning specific names, for example, when we talk about Leila and the Victoria book, do we have to go through the Very briefly, yes, you would have to, because you would say, you know, if you're talking about Lila, who's kind of really experimenting with her various identities, I mean, she's the one person who's really pushing the boundaries, right? So you would have to tell us, that for sure. Yeah. Not in huge detail, yeah. but you just have to introduce her as a character, because she's an important character for your argument. We need to know who she is. Yeah. So if we turn to Srinivas, those of you are reading Srinivas, 
So Srinivas, remember, this is not a religion of the book. There is no stated creed. There's nothing, there's no propositional belief that you have to state. So here, belief has some kind of subjective commitment to the truth. The believing self stuff doesn't really work in Srinivas. Right? What we find instead is people who are experimenting with rituals, whether it's the priests or whether it's the worshippers, to try and build a better world for themselves. In this world, right? they want more opportunities, they want to know how to handle precarity, they'd like more money, they'd like lovely flats, whatever it is. So religion becomes a resource to get some things that they want. Right? This is not about belief. It's not about some kind of subjective commitment to some truth. It's a way of saying, well, these things are important to me. I can work really hard, I can study really hard, and I can get the qualifications to get this job that I want. But that's not enough, because this world is precarious. There's a lot of people like me who study really hard and work really hard, and I need some extra help. Then they turn to ritual. And the priests are competing with each other to get those people to come to their particular temples. Right? So we're seeing something that looks very, very far away from the believing selves kind of idea. Rather, we see something that looks closer to Coleman and Lindquist's argument, or even Needham's argument, that actually not all of the anthropology of religion needs to focus on belief. We can speak against belief, or that belief does not have to be a crucial. Does that make sense? Yeah? So having picked your ethnographic arguments and you're drawing one from the other in some way, and I'll show you how in a minute. Yeah, then you come to your conclusion. Right? Which is the final part. So you started with a concept or a theme or a set of concepts or whatever. You've taken that in a journey through your two ethnographies, you will have arrived somewhere slightly different from where you started because of those ethnographies. So then you tell us right, that, yes, in certain religious complexes, in this particular case, belief is really crucially important, but it doesn't look like just a statement of belief. It actually requires work. In other cases, actually, as in Srinivas, we don't even need to worry about believing as a central concept in the anthropology religion. Rather, we might want to turn to you know, ritual, and more specifically, what ritual does in the mundane world. Right? So you can say that belief and ritual then are, are, are toolkits, conceptual toolkits. And we don't use all of them in the same ways when we're thinking about different ethnographic contexts. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So what I've done here, and I, what I'd like you to do before the revision session, this is, is essentially, I've given you a table. You can keep adding other concepts or themes, you can put multiple concepts or themes in as you like. Try and populate these very briefly as I've done, and that will help you select your topics for your essay. Yeah? You don't have to populate all of them, but if you think, okay, I think I want to put ritual and effervescence together, I think I can do that with the two ethnographies I'm reading, then just try it out. Briefly, very briefly, in the way that I've done, yeah? And you can see I've, d I've done it very, very briefly, yeah? And if you can do that and you think, yes, that my ethnography supports this kind of argument, it also allows you to sharpen your argument at the outset. Once you've got your discussions, ethnographic discussions in place, then you can sharpen your argument and you can see what you want to say. Does that make sense? So try it and bring it to the workshop and we can look over, we can group you, we can work together. I mean, one thing that I want to tell you is that when we mark your work, we're not marking your work against each other. Yeah? We're marking them absolutely against the criteria. That means you are not in competition with each other. You're only in competition with yourselves. 
So you don't lose anything by talking to each other about the stuff or interacting in a workshop. You gain. Yeah? Because someone else does well does not mean your marks will go down. We don't have a quota for this many firsts, this many two ones or so on. Yeah? We're marking against the criteria. Each essay is taken on its own. Okay? So discuss with each other, make your tables, bring it to the workshop and we can we can play with them. Okay? Does this help? Does this help you see how you can structure? Yeah? Okay. Try that. And I'm gonna also show you essay structures. Okay. So essentially this kind of question, any question that you're gonna get in a discursive subject like anthropology, history, philosophy, whatever it is. There's basically two kinds of structures. Okay? I mean, there are other kinds of structures. I'm not going to go into them now, but these are the two basic ones. Okay? The first one is what I call a fish skeleton model. Okay? So in the fish skeleton model, your introduction is the head of the fish. Okay? You are saying, this is what I'm going to do. These are my key terms. These are the things I need to set in place so that I can make my argument. The argument is the spine. Yeah? And then these side bones of the skeleton give you your evidence to build up your argument. Yeah? You need them to support the spine. And then you have your conclusion, which is the tail. Okay? So let's, so this kind of structure is really good for an and also style of argument. Okay, there are two kinds of argumentation you can do. Do you know this? Has anyone explained to you this kind of structure? Yeah? Okay. There are two kinds of arguments you can do. And remember, these two kinds of arguments you can do anywhere. When you leave university, when you go into graduate level jobs, when someone says to you, tell me how to think about this, which they will in graduate level jobs, you can say you can think about it in this way, but, or you can say you can think about it in this way and also in this way. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. So the fish skeleton structure is really useful for an and also style of argument. So you can say one thing, very precise, very specific. You can say, and also this other thing, and also this other thing. So that you end up with a body of evidence that supports a single argument. Yeah? Does that make sense? OK. So let's see what that looks like. I'm just giving you an example just from Lerman to make things simple here. Yeah. yeah? So here we have the head. This is all up on Blackboard, so you know, just look and, and see what I'm doing. So, definition of belief according to Simon and Carlyle. What's your question? State it up front. Tell us how Lerman's work helps you answer this question and why. Yeah? So, you've set up your introduction. That's your head of your fish. Okay? So, now you've set up that spine. Yeah? Because you've said this is what. I'm saying, this is what I'm using, this is what I'm saying, you set up your spine. Okay? So now, we start building the evidence. Yeah? Argument one. What is the actual concrete work that goes into creating a belief itself? Well, one is prayer practice and learning. You explain what that is. And the second one, is how prayer practice allows people to build up what they call spiritual maturity, which means that they can even handle times when there's prayer failure or when there's dryness. Yeah. So you need this level of prayer practice to build up this level of spiritual maturity, and bo both of those are important for that believing self to be stable in some way. Does that make sense? Yeah, do you see how both these arguments feed into that? Okay. And then you have your conclusion, which says, okay, someone like Needham said, forget about the word belief, we don't want it. But actually, there are religions where belief is really important. Christianity is one of them. 
So maybe we need something, you know, we need to work with belief. And Simon and Carla give us a way of working with belief through this notion of the believing selves. And we can see how that believing self is built up in love. Done. Yeah? Does that, does that make sense? So it's a very straightforward and also kind of structure. So that you can end up saying, look, all of this adds up to this. Yay. Yeah? Okay. So the second model, which is another classic model, well, the first skeleton model, I've kind of invented the, the diagrammatic version, but this is the classic model of SRS. Yeah? This also works very well in anthropology. The first one works very well in anthropology because you're building up the ethnographic evidence to say, look, all of this is telling us this thing. This model is the, what you can call the yes but model, okay? So here's your thesis or your hypothesis or here's your description of what someone else has argued. Okay, any of those can take that place of that thesis. Yeah? Then you have an antithesis where you say, yes, but actually, hang on a second. Yeah? And then you have your synthesis which says, okay, so here's the thesis, and it goes up to a point, but therefore we have to think about this in a slightly different way. That's your conclusion. Does that make sense? So this is another very classic model of essay structuring. You can use either of these structures to answer this essay question. It's set up so that you can either build up evidence, da -da 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 -da, or you can say, mm, yeah, but, oh, okay, we might have to end up somewhere different from where we started. It's, it's your choice, but it depends on what your argument is and what evidence you're building up. Okay, so we can have, I'm giving you an example here. So smuggling in of certain Christian assumptions in the study of religion means there has perhaps been an overemphasis on the importance of belief in religion. But lots of religions do not emphasize belief, and even in those that do, it is hard to take statements of belief at face value. So Needham says, just ditch the concept of belief. Fine, that's what Needham says. Great. Yes, but Needham's actually being a little bit over the top here. He's just you know, making a point, a polemic point for the sake of making it. I'm not buying that point. But instead, I'm going to think with um, Simon and Coleman, sorry, Coleman and Lindquist and uh, Simon and Carlyle to say that belief does have a place in the conceptual toolbox. And ethnographically, we can see how that plays out in, for instance, Lerman. Yeah? So we've set up our yes but. So we come to a little mini conclusion here, because remember, for the final essay, we're working with two ethnographies. So we come to a mini conclusion here. Actually, in, in, in religious communities like the vineyard, belief is really important. But it's not just an either or or just a simple statement of belief. It actually involves crafting a believing self, which requires a lot of work, many conclusion. But should we, when we turn to another ethnography, for example, Srinivas, we find that we can throw belief out of the window. Yeah? Does that make sense? So you get a good yes but going on here if you're working with Srinivas. Tell me if I'm going too fast and stop me if you have any questions. This is, this is all up on Blackboard, so you know, don't, don't worry about taking notes. So just look and think and ask. Does that make sense, people? Yeah? OK. And then if you're working with Srinivas, you might have, you'll have a synthesis, right? So that's your conclusion. So depending on the religious community, belief can be very important. Although we should heed Needham's point that we just don't take what people are saying as just evidence that that's the way they understand the world, we might want to pay a lot of attention to how they craft that believing self, in the case of Lerman. In some other religions, we can heed Needham's argument and just not think about belief because the ethnography doesn't support a focus on belief. Done. Yeah? Does that, does that make sense, the yes but mode? to come to a conclusion which is different from where you started? 
Yeah? Okay. So I've given you examples from each of the books. So, you know, because I know that you're all reading different books, so you're reading three books between all of you. So here you can see how you might take that argument if you're working with Feder. and how you might synthesize it. Or with liberatory. Yeah. If we're doing this structure, how would we then incorporate like, parts two and three of the question? Yeah, so one way to do it is to really think about part two as your invitation to start the yes but or and also modality. So you can start with one ethnography, and if, if your argument is supported by the other ethnography as well, then you go into an and also modality to move into the next ethnography. If your second ethnography is really very different from your first ethnography, say you're working with Srinivas for your second ethnography, then you move into a yes but modality. So part two is where you're really sitting with those two ethnographies and you're using either yes but or and also to connect them to your bigger theme. Yeah? Does that make sense? So that, that gives you that space to really delve into the ethnographies, to give enough detail that you can actually build up your evidence and then either support it with an and also argument or you know, problematize it with a yes but argument. So that you can have a conclusion at the end. So is that clear, people? Yeah. Remember, the longer the question, the more guidance there is within it for you to work with. Yeah. So really treat this question as a mode of structure. That's how it's designed, and it's designed very specifically in this way, so that when you come next year to your dissertations, where you have to find your own question. And it's not that you have a bunch of set texts. You have to figure out what ethnographies, what papers, what articles you want to read. You will start have learned through this how to think about all these things and put them together. Yeah? So here you're being given a very guided way to start posing that question and building up evidence, either and also kind of evidence or yes but kind of evidence. Yeah? So really work with the structuring to guess where you want to get. Okay. So here we have the yes but laboratory with the synthesis. Okay. So here I'm essentially asking you to kind of try doing this with a fish skeleton if you want to do an and also. So when we go back to this, this is what this table allows you to do. Yeah? Does that make sense? So now you can start thinking, okay, what does Lerman allow me to say about ritual? What does my second monograph allow me to say about ritual? Together, why do they make me think about ritual in a slightly different way from where I started? Yeah? And what does that tell me about how ethnography changes these conceptual tools? So try populating this. There's also a uh, no, that's not. Uh, where is it, Tom? What am I looking for? The grid. The grid. I hover over the word thing. Yeah. Aha. Okay. There's also a grid here that just puts together some of the topics and frameworks and concepts that we've worked with throughout this. You don't just have to use these, obviously, <coughs> but there are sub ones, as many of you have, as you just said, you were thinking about liminality. So there are other ways of thinking about these things, and that's fine. You can introduce your own concepts that you find within the ethnographies or within the programmatic texts, but here are the ones that we've worked with. Yeah, you can put them together, for instance, you know, for instance, suppose you wanted to work with practice theory and practice. They're kind of similar, but they're not, right? Because practice theory comes from Bourdieu, which is about that social theme. It's about that semi-autonomous action. It's about the position of capital. It's about relative um, um, control of power and resources, 
right? So in fact, Bourdieu's practice theory really doesn't work for Lerman. Works incredibly well for Hegel. Works pretty well for parts of liberatory. Kind of works for Schrodinger. So you might start with those ethnographies and say, but actually, you know, we don't have to have this whole big theory of practice if we just take the key point that Bourdieu is emphasizing, look at what people are doing, and we can learn quite a lot that allows you to move into a mix, into the world, where we don't see those kinds of structures, right? It's pretty flat. Does that make sense? So you can put things together to show how practice theory does some kinds of things, but actually you might not want all of it, you might just want to take this attention to what people are doing, and that allows you to think about religion and science. Yeah? So the grid is there, the table is there, everything is up on the blackboard. So just play with these things. And then next week we'll have one more hour on revision in the second hour, and then we'll have the revision version. Okay? Great. Thank you very much. Oh, if anyone wants to come to an office, I'll just uh, wait for me and you can walk back with me. Fish things and blast from the park. <laughs> yes. I mean, I find it a very satisfying way of structuring. Mm. Yeah. The spine. So the love. And also, and also, yeah. it's yeah. dance. Yeah. Look. Yeah. <laughs> of course, she didn't. I can't ask her now, so I have to go to her up now. Yes, it's next time. Huh? Yes, it's next time. So basically, I think she said to do it here, right? Yeah, we'll yeah. go to the department. You're coming to the office yes, hour? Yes, yeah. if it's possible. Of course. Yeah. Go to you. Are you following me to an office hour? I spilled my lunch all over my shirt and had to wash it two minutes before my lecture. So very exciting. So I was almost late too. <laughs> But we haven't had a lecture, so I'm just trying to read that. Right. The PowerPoint is up, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the modernity lecture, there isn't really a podcast. Are you like male? Yeah, yeah. 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 There isn't really a podcast, but there's a very individual lecture. Yeah, I've